a little bit about her. So, Her Evolution is a nonprofit organization focused on inspiring girls and women who are facing multiple barriers to embrace STEM careers. Based in Toronto, Canada, Her Evolution is the go to place for youth, particularly young women from underserved communities, to come to in order to advance in 21st century skills. We exist to create opportunities for the next generation of women in STEM connecting them with leaders in the industry for career support. We listen to the needs of the community and that of STEM industry to better help the next generation of underserved youth with a focus on young women to enter STEM. In service of our mission and opportunity for current and future college and university leaders passionate about improving gender equity in STEM, Hervolution has created the Hervolution Ambassador Program. So today, me and Sarah on the call, um, we're two of a few of the ambassadors at Hervolution right now. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. Um, I'm a second year student at the University of Guelph, and I'm studying uh, applied human nutrition with an emphasis in dietetics. Um, I'm hoping at the end of my undergraduate degree to go to medical school. Um, and I wanted to be a doctor in North, Northern Ontario. Um, I joined the ambassador program um, because I wanna help under, underserviced communities and um, young girls go into STEM careers um, and to see what STEM careers has to offer. Okay, and I'm Alexa. I'm a grade 11 student in Sarnia, Ontario. It's like three hours outside of Toronto. Um, I enjoy being active and I'm a part of my high school's track and squash teams, but I also really love STEM and I plan to go into medical school hopefully in the future. Um, I joined the program because I love STEM and I'm passionate about raising awareness about gender gaps in the workplace. Um, so now we'll just go around and I'll have the panelists just say who they are, um, what their occupation is, and where they're currently residing, and then we'll get into some of the questions that we have. So whoever wants to go first can. I can go first. Um, so hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Simone Julian. I'm a registered nurse. Um, currently, I'm residing in Toronto, and I work for Anishinaabe Health Toronto, which is a Indigenous health organization. Um, so I'm in the diabetes education program. Um, yeah. So thank you for um, having me. I'm look looking forward to our discussion. I can go next. Um, so I'm Laura. I am a registered dietitian located here in Atacoke in Ontario. Um, I'm originally from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, I work in our hospital, long-term care, outpatient. I manage our dietary department. I'm a jack of all trades a little bit. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, for having me and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. I'm Jessica Goslin. I'm an occupational therapist, also residing in Atacokan. Um, I think Laura sums it up well. I am also a jack of all trades, which will probably be the trend of rural registered healthcare professions. I'm Joanne. I'm a rural family physician, also in Atacokan. I work with uh, Laura and Jessica. Um, I am from Southern Ontario, went to McMaster University uh, for engineering, um, and then moved on to medical school, and Jack of all trades is a rural physician in Atacokan. Okay, thanks for taking the time to be with us tonight. So as we've already discussed, it's called Healthcare in the North. Um, our first question is going to be. Um, so our first question is 
kind of broad. It's what interested you to pursue the career you have chosen? Maybe it's a certain experience. Maybe it's been your dream since you were a little kid. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear that from you guys. I guess I'll go first. Um, so I kind of fell into occupational therapy. Um, I pursued an undergraduate degree in kinesiology and for a long time, um, I had thought that I wanted to be a physiotherapist. Um, I think my undergraduate degree kind of really enhanced my like enjoyment of physical rehab and kind of the phys med side of things. Um, but as I kind of got closer to the end of my undergrad, I started to have um, like certain family members access healthcare. And it kind of raised the question, like what happens when you can't get better? Um, and so I kind of was exposed to OT that way and kind of saw how broad the scope was and that there is adaptation when remediation is not available. Um, and it also offered me kind of both sides. I can help with remediation, help people get better, but I also help people adapt and get back to their meaningful activities and, and to be able to enjoy their life after losing that ability. I can, I can go. Um, so almost 13 years ago, um, I think even just before I started college, I, I did co-op in 12th grade and I, uh, I shadowed a nurse um, in Mount Sinai Hospital. And I, um, I remember it was a high risk pregnancy unit. And I just, I just loved the interaction with the clients. Um, it was very holistic approach, which I really liked. Um, and that's part of my philosophy of nursing is holistic care, seeing the person as a whole. And I was like, you know what, I think I, I, think I wanna get into nursing. So um, I started college first. I was a practical nurse at first because I was like, well, let me see if I'll like this. Um, uh, so, I went to Centennial College and then I graduated. And then I worked in the city for a little bit, um, maybe less than a year. And yeah, I just, I was like, I need to think out of the box. I was, I really wanted to just explore what was out there. So I kind of fell into Northern nursing. I, well, we had Workopolis at the time. I know it's Indeed now, but we had Workopolis at the time. And I was just scrolling, scrolling through various um, jobs. And because at the time it was practical, like at that time when there's practical nursing, it was a lot of like long-term care. Um, so I was like, okay, let me see what else is out there. So I saw a place called Inubic and I was like, where's that? I had no idea. And I looked on the map, I was like, oh, wow. Okay, so I just said, why not? So I applied and about a month later, I got a call and I did the interview and I, I fell into it. I, I went on that plane and the plane was getting smaller the farther I was going up north. And from there, I just, I, can, I did continue education. I went back to school and I got my bachelor of science degree in nursing. And um, so I did more remote nursing stations. Um, so I lived in Northwest Territories for five years. And then I, I came home for a little bit. And then I started doing contract work in none of it and also did um, some in Northern Ontario. So I just, I literally fell into it after I um, graduated nursing school, continued education and just loved it um, for various reasons, but that's pretty much how it happened. Yeah. I guess I can go. Um, so I don't really remember exactly why, what interested me in nutrition specifically. I remember making the decision back in um, grade 11. I knew I wanted to do something in healthcare. I really liked um, the sciences and I liked um, the human aspect of it. Um, so I did, again, like Simone, I did a high school co-op placement uh, with a registered dietitian in long-term care. And I really liked it. I thought it was like an interesting um, facet of healthcare because it's a bit more preventative than other aspects of healthcare, which, which really interested me. Um, 
so from there, I, um, I went to university, I studied nutrition and uh, got a job in as a dietitian here in Northern Ontario. And then other jobs I've worked um, in nutrition where I've worked as like, like a dietary aid and things like that as well to kind of see nutrition from, from various sides as well. So I also kind of just found it by by, I don't know if it's accident or, or kind of uh, without intention, I guess. Joanne here. I um, started university, as I had said, as an engineer. Um, my dad is an engineer, uh, made sense to I uh, use my math and my science skills and uh, attended McMaster which was close to my home for engineering and at that time in chemical engineering it was really the beginnings of biomedical and being uh, an older student who had gone to McMaster for medical school. So because of those two reasons, really, um, I started developing an interest in, in uh, medicine and did some volunteer work as a porter emergency department at MAC. Um, later on in my university years, um, and was really fortunate to be admitted to McMaster for medical school. And um, back then there was a university rural kind of showed up in that. So interesting stories uh, to some of uh, some of the other. So I came to Atacokan, and apparently there's some audio trouble with my microphone. Um, I'll keep trying. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed working in Atacokan, um, being able to talk with my uh, colleagues um, about cases and the nursing and, and the rehab department and, and, and everything. So I stayed. It's really nice to hear how everyone's paths are so different and yet they all led you to similar careers. Um, our next question is, what is your educational background? I can start. Um, oh, sorry, Jess. Um, so I started out, so after high school, knowing that I, I was interested in nutrition, I applied to three different schools. I applied for nutrition at Ottawa U, so their integrated nutrition program. Uh, I applied to Brescia, at, which is affiliated with Western. And then as, like I mentioned, I'm from Sault Ste. Marie. So just in case I was gonna chicken out, I applied to go to Laurentian and for nursing, not because I felt like nursing was chickening out, just it being closer to home. I am, I am too chicken to be a nurse anyways. So um, I ended up going to Ottawa U for my first year out of, uni or out of high school. It was uh, a difficult experience for me actually. I found it really hard to be away from home. I found the school work um, really overwhelming. So I ended up dropping out of that um, program and going back home to Sault Ste. Marie. And I figured I'd take a year to kind of um, kind of reset sort of thing. So I went to university. Um, I went to 
uh, Auto or Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie and just kind of did um, a variety of different courses and took biology. I ended up really liking biology, so I actually got a whole degree in biology um, and did a, a, an honors thesis and things like that on microplastics. Um, once I graduated from that, I was working in a pharmacy, uh, which I had done throughout my, my degree and kind of felt like, yeah, this isn't really what I want to do. I wasn't really finding work uh, in ecology or in, in biology and nutrition was still kind of always in the back of my mind. So I decided to go back to school. And at that time I went to Brescia, which is in London and studied uh, human nutrition. And so I got an honors bachelor of nutrition from Western. And then after that, so to become a registered dietitian, you have to do a one year uh, dietetic internship, which you have to apply to separately after your undergraduate degree. So I applied to various programs throughout Ontario and I was accepted to NOSM's program, which is called NODIP, the Northern Ontario um, Dietetic Internship Program. And I was placed in in my hometown of Sault Ste. Marie, which was nice because it was an unpaid year of internship. So I got to live at home and I did one placement in um, Huntsville, Ontario, which was really cool. And the placements involved doing like uh, clinical work, uh, public health work, um, managerial work and, um, and outpatient diabetes and things like that. So once we did that, or once that was finished, then I wrote an exam, like a, a board exam, and that was it, five years later. Well, a lot more if you count the biology degree, but several years later. <laughs> um, I can go. Um, so I went into kinesiology out of high school, um, kind of how I mentioned earlier. Um, so I went into kinesiology because I played a lot of sports growing up, it seemed, um, really up my alley. It was between kin and nursing. Nursing seems to be the um, other option for both Laura and I. Um, however, my mother is a nurse um, and that it kind of swayed me towards the kin piece. Again, not cut out for a nurse. I think nurses are great, but um, and so I did uh, four years of an honors bachelor in kinesiology at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. Did a whole lot of volunteering, did a whole lot of job shadowing, um, to try and figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and so I had a professor tell me that he thought I would be a good occupational therapist. So I really leaned into that. Um, I applied to a whole bunch of schools and ended up going to University of Toronto to do my master's degree um, in occupational therapy. Um, while I was there, um, the great part about a professional master's is um, lots of on the job kind of training. So you do for kind of professional placement. Um, so I got a lot of exposure, um, mostly in Toronto. So I did um, an acute care at North York General. I was lucky enough to go to Trinidad and Tobago for two months to do a uh, placement there at a special needs school. And then I um, did a placement at a burn um, and trauma unit uh, at Sunny Rook Hospital. And then my last placement led me back to Northern Ontario I did a community placement um, at Partners in Rehab in Thunder Bay. Um, and then you write your national exam and become an OT, fingers crossed. So I'll go next. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, so I graduated uh, high school and then um, I went to um, Centennial College and I, I got my diploma in uh, practical nursing. Still wanted to see if this was something I wanted to do. Um, so I moved away from home and I moved to Inuvik. I was there for, for like a couple of years. That was my first Northern experience. Like I just went in. <laughs> like, um, so uh, it, was, it was great. It was a culture shock. You know, because I was I was I was born in Edmonton, but I was raised in Toronto. So I was raised in a like, city. So that was a huge culture shock for me. A very rich experience, um, experiencing uh, you know twenty four hour daylight and twenty four hour darkness and um, just the, the very cold. But it's a dry cold, so 
I, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> it's actually, you can warm up in dry cold compared to damp cold here. So um, I just, yeah, I, I continued. So I was doing practical nursing. Um, I had a little bit more autonomy up north at that time. So it was really good for my leadership and my confidence. Um, so that was, that was great. The autonomy was fantastic. And I was able to um, have more of a leadership role because um, I was doing like community living. Uh, so a lot of autonomy. So I really, really liked that. I was like, I really want to continue. Um, so I went to uh, Yellowknife, which is who's affiliated and they're affiliated with uh, University of Victoria. So I did their um, collaborative program. So I did the, they say LPN there. So the Licensed Practical Nursing Bridging Program. So I moved to Yellowknife. I lived there for about three years. Um, and then I took a break. Yeah, I took a break. Um, life happens sometimes. Sometimes you need to take a break and take care of other things, which I did. Um, and then I said, okay, I'm going back. But actually the time that I took the break, I was doing contract work in Nunavut. And I felt like my break was a little long, <laughs> but I was getting good experience at that time as a practical nurse as well, but I was doing um, long-term care. And, um, but I was doing, I was doing care. I was providing care for elders and I had a, like a, a 10 patient, it was 10 patients, 10 clients in uh, long-term care, but the responsibility, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you just have 10 there. I'm like, you cannot compare <laughs> Northern nursing to the city, um, you know, in long-term care, you know, there was a lot more, you know, in the North, yes, it's 10 clients and, and here maybe 20 odd clients that a nurse who's the leader at on those shifts it but there's still challenges and it's just it, it's it's a different way of nursing indigenous healthcare. It, it, it's it's different um for different reasons that I'm sure we'll touch on later on but um so I decided you know what I'm going to go back let me finish so I went to Victoria um the U of Vic University of Victoria and I completed my bachelor of science degree there and uh, it was it was wonderful because there was still indigenous healthcare incorporated into my curriculum in Yellowknife as well as in U of Vic. Um, so, yeah, I was still exposed to the healthcare um, and just um, cultural historical um, lenses was just embedded into my um, education to really prepare me to be a remote nurse. Um, uh, a, a, a nurse in remote in remote areas so yeah that's that's pretty much it thank you um so yeah i i started uh started as an engineer and did attend um mcmaster university for for medicine um and in those three years at mcmaster um with the electives um, that we have um, available to go and explore other opportunities. Um, I did a rotation in sports medicine in Hamilton, um, which was really great. Um, I did a surgical rotation in, um, in Britain, in Wales. Um, that was an amazing opportunity just for skills building, hands-on um, confidence as well. Um, and I was able to go to Calgary and see the Rockies and travel around a bit while I did a elective um, in neonatology with, uh, with the newborn babies. Um, and I had a rural medicine um, exposure in, um, in Meifer, just outside of Collingwood, so in family medicine. So I did some family medicine and emergency department work in Collingwood and also in, uh, in Meaford, which is the smaller town just, just west of there. So those were all great um, educational opportunities within my core um, medical school um, that kind of showed me the world and, and gave me confidence in, in procedures and, and um, the traveling um, and going to new places. Um, and I was in Sudbury as well for um, a obstetrics rotation. They do a high volume obstetrics rotation as part of the McMaster Medical School curriculum. So it was very, very busy. Um, and then um, did my internship, which is the one year um, after medical school in Ottawa. 
um, and um, just another city to see and, and have an experience there. So that was um, my educational background um, with McMaster. Um, when I first came to Atacokan, um, the year that I had in my internship in Ottawa, a number of my classmates came up to Thunder Bay and they were the very first class of family medicine residents um, through um, the rural family medicine training program, um, which has now evolved in, to be part of NOSM, which is the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So I had a good uh, crew of friends um, nearby um, that were studying in Thunder Bay in that inaugural class. Um, when I came up to Atacokan. Okay, so our next question is, why did you choose to work in the North? Um, this could be, you know, maybe you just got a job offer and you're like, hey, why not? Or maybe you had a plan to come work up here all along. So we'd also love to hear that. I can go. Um, I didn't pre-read these questions. <laughs> it's kind of funny that I was talking about my friends who were in Thunder Bay doing the rural family medicine program. I, I think that partly gave me the confidence to come up to Atacokan um, and to a place I'd never been before. Um, and uh, but I, I chose to come closer to people that I knew um, and try the rural medicine um, experience that I had had a little taste of uh, in Meaford um, in my training um, and a uh, great group of colleagues um, that really um, fostered new new people and and I think that has continued for for 30 years right any of the healthcare providers in Attico can um, do tend over the years to have learners and and new new colleagues that they mentor um, uh, through the beginnings of their careers. Um, so I had a, a great experience and that's partly what kept me, kept me here that um, I had that um, good support structure early on. Um, I can go. So I am actually from Atacogan. So I was born here, grew up here, left and I was like, I am never coming back. I was determined to, to stay in Southern Ontario when I went to University of Toronto. Um, and then obviously doing all my um, clinical placement through my master's degree, I was exposed to a whole bunch of stuff. I actually thought I would move to Trinidad uh, for a bit and work there because the work-life balance is just great. Um, but uh, my last placement was in community um, occupational therapy in Thunder Bay. Um, and so I think that was, what kind of propelled me back into Northern Ontario. Um, so I think like the, the fear aspect wasn't there because I grew up here. So it was actually fairly comfortable for me. Um, and it just so happened that a friend of mine sent me, a, they needed like an urgent mat leave coverage just for like the last four months of someone's mat leave um, for a job in Kenora. Um, and it was for like an acute care uh, role, which I felt pretty comfortable in. So I, I applied into it and I got it. And it was a very low commitment because it was only four months. Um, and yeah, from there, I kind of continued onward and, and jumped around to a few different uh, communities and, and jobs there. Um, so yeah, I just kind of rolled on into it. But it kind of always sucks you back when you're from here, I think. Well, my experience was, so I finished my, my dietetic internship and was working in a long-term care facility back in Sault Ste. Marie. And I, I liked Sault Ste. Marie, but I knew that um, just from the job situation at the hospital there, which is where I, where I thought for sure I wanted to work, that um, it was going to be a lot of maternity leave coverage for the next couple of years. And there weren't really any, many of those coming up just yet. So I started branching out and applying to, to other um, places. I was looking a lot on Indeed and just kind of practicing writing cover letters and, and tweaking my resume for different jobs. I applied to a lot of jobs in Southern Ontario and wasn't super successful there. 
Then I got an email from the coordinator of our internship program who would occasionally send out um, job opportunities in Northern Ontario. And it was a posting for a maternity leave coverage too in, in Atacokan. And the posting said, this job has it all. So it, it had long-term care, acute care, management, outpatient, home care. So I figured what the heck, I can do anything for an 18 month contract. And I figured that would set me up really well for any job I wanted moving forward because I would have 18 months experience in basically every area of nutrition. Um, so I, I sent off my resume and I told my dad, I just applied for a job in Atacokan. And he said, do you know how far that is? <laughs> and I didn't really at the time, but I thought, oh, whatever, I'm up for an adventure. Um, and so I ended up getting a call. I got an interview. Uh, I was offered the job. So I dragged my friend Andrea up to on a road trip to Atacokan to see what I was getting myself into. And like Joanne kind of mentioned, just kind of the, the hospitality I got when I came to visit sort of thing. And um, just the kind of the uh, the vibes that they were giving off were really good. I felt like I was gonna be really supported in my first job. And it seemed like the people I worked with had really good sense of the humor and um, would be really supportive. So I decided to dive in. Um, and I've been here since then. So the, the person I was covering for maternity, or their maternity leave decided um, to pursue other things. So I now work in this position um, permanently, which is great and I'm really enjoying it. Um, so as I mentioned, like I kind of fell into um, Northern nursing, um, but I will say why I chose to continue on. Um, I love the simplicity. It was lovely. I would walk to work. <laughs> it took me less than 10 minutes. Um, I just, I loved the nature, the fresh, crisp air. Um, so I think I was, I, I think it was a lot more of self-discovery over time. I was learning, oh, I like this. I like the simplicity of walking to work and not having to travel so far. I had balance, you know, so that part was, was great. That was a personal thing of why I, I chose to say, stay, I mean, continue on in Northern nursing. Um, and then I value in my professional, you know, lens, I was able to, to be with the clients. Uh, get to know them, you know, it gave me that time and that connection. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I had something to compare to, and that was uh, practicing at home in Toronto. And I felt that sometimes that, that, that rush that, you know, I, I, I sometimes for me, because everybody's different, that didn't sit right with me. I wanted to get to know the client. Where do you live? Um, you know, uh, let, you know, incorporate more cultural, uh, cultural um, considerations into their care, which I'm just, it, it, it just, it, it was wonderful. It, it, you know, even just food, you know, giving an elderly person um, traditional tuktu, which is caribou and just see their face light up and just, you know, th those were the, it was these small little rewards um, just throughout the day when I would be with clients and the language, um, the challenge, I felt, I felt I was challenged every day, um, professionally, personally, interpersonally. It was really great for my character. Um, I think my character, just being self-reflective, because you have a lot of days where it's really quiet. <laughs> um, so you had a lot of time to reflect and who you are uh, as a per personally and as, as and professionally. So that's what I loved about the North. It was, it was very quiet, but it also allowed you to really self-discover and to, to, to pour into your clients and take that time. Um, and I loved that I was able to be like resourceful and advocate so that over time I was learning like these were the things that were important to me advocating for clients, being with them, uh, getting to know them as a whole person, not just parts. Um, and just the culture being out on the land, like even if I was off, you know, I, I could go outside and walk around and see the nature. Um, go out onto the land and see the animals and the lakes. It was just such a rich experience and the northern lights. And I was like, I'm not leaving here. <laughs> so I would just, I'm coming back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. 
So I just, I really, really grew such a huge passion for uh, the demographic. Um, and then each community had its uniqueness to it. There were similarities, but there was an individual uniqueness to each community. And so I was always learning, con like always learning, whether it was language, whether it was family dynamics, um, historical, cultural um, things. Like just, it was such a, I just, I really, really loved it. Um, so I just, I would just keep going. I know I had <laughs> friends like, why do you go? Like you keep going, there's nothing to do. I'm like, there's a lot to do. And it fills, it fills me up. And when I'm with clients, it was always in an exchange. So I just, I just kept going. That's why I chose, we're continuing to choose to work there. Um, and yeah, and it inspired me to continue going to school. So yeah, thank you. Those are all very interesting. I've never been to the North, but it's sounding really appealing. Now I wanna go. Um, our next question is, why did you stay in the North? So like, if you want to add anything else, otherwise we can just move on. Well, I, um, I didn't intend to stay in the North. Like I said, I was going to come get my experience and head back down to hopefully Sault Ste. Marie where, where my family was from or, or the area. Um, I just figured I would stay here for, for the length of the maternity leave and then head back. Um, then as I mentioned, the dietitian, who I was replacing, it was becoming clearer before she resigned that that she wasn't that she wasn't interested in coming back. And while I was um, here in Atacokan, I was just really enjoying the lifestyle, getting to know, like making friends, getting out and enjoying nature, kind of like Simone said, I really enjoyed the nature here as well. Um, getting out, learning how to fish, because that's something you have to learn how to do when you, in you live in Atacokan, as I found out um and going camping things like that so and then the other piece like the from a professional standpoint I really enjoy um the variety that I see like I said at the start like I'm a jack of all trades so and I learn every day you're kind of always on your toes every day is different kind of all the cliche sayings um but it's really true and it's it's like the most challenging aspect of my job and it's the aspect of my job that I like the most. And like I said, I wanted to work, I thought I wanted to just be an inpatient clinical dietitian, like on a surgical unit or something in, in, in Sault Ste. Marie or, or in Southern Ontario. But once I kind of got a taste for this of doing a little bit of everything, I thought that that might be a little bit boring to go back to, to, to just seeing, treating, um, setting them up for discharge and sending them home. Whereas here, I actually get to follow people when they get discharged from the hospital, I get to work with them in the community, I can go to their house, I can see them out and about kind of thing. And it's really rewarding from that sense, whereas in the hospital, once somebody gets discharged, it's kind of like they just fall off the face of the earth. You, you don't hear about what goes on with them afterwards. So that's why I really like it here in Northern Ontario. I think Laura stole a lot of what I was going to say. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I feel like I would be naive to say I'm not staying here because I'm not because I'm from here. Um, but, uh, I, I think like the having roots here definitely pulled me towards Northern Ontario from a, a personal sense, but from a, a professional sense, I think you won't find the kind of flexibility and autonomy in your career in Southern Ontario. There, we will get into the advantages and disadvantages later, but the, there is something to be said for being a jack of all trades. I think the, the jack of all trades, master of none quote gets thrown around a lot and it tends to be interpreted quite negatively. Um, but the rest of the quote is, so it's jack of all trades or master of none, but a master of none is often better than a master of one because that kind of cycle of Groundhog's Day, you're doing the same thing every day is, what makes people compliant and bored in their careers. And I think working in the North, you will never get bored because you're always challenged every day. Um, like Laura said, like you don't really know what to expect every day. Um, similar to Laura, I work in acute care. I work in our long-term care. 
I work in home care and I also treat um, upper extremity injuries in our outpatient department. So that whole circle of care and that holistic approach that OT offers, I get to do in the full spectrum of I treat someone in acute care. I do emergency department consults. I also like, okay, hey, cool. I'm gonna see them at home now. And I get to follow up on those recommendations and continue to build that therapeutic relationship that I've already kind of solidified in those you know, one or two other steps. Most people admitted to our long-term care home. I already know them. I've already had involvement with them. Um, and it just makes such a, a fluid, smooth transition for the families and our patients. Um, and I think, building those relationships, sure, it benefits the patients, but we're naive to say that it doesn't benefit us and fill up our cups because we're in it often not for ourselves. We're doing it because we want to impact people's lives. Um, so I think that's my long-winded way of saying that there are lots of reasons to um, that I stayed in the North, but I think the, the broad scope and the flexibility in my job are definitely at the top of my list. I will share, um, like I, I'm currently not in the North right now, um, but I miss it all the time. I really, really do. And just, just as Jessica mentioned, we'll get into the advantages and just di disadvantages for sure. Um, but I, I, I have to be uh, transparent. I miss it all the time. I do. Um, I think if, if uh, you know, cause you know, everyone's, um, family dynamics are different, everyone's different responsibilities, you know, it, it you know, everyone has unique situations, but um, I, I definitely, I'm not there now, um, and I, I continue to care for the um, Indigenous people, um, but um, cause that was pretty much my specialty in, in, in that area, but I will admit I miss it all the time. I really do. And it's, it's just so lovely to hear everybody because I just like I'm feeding I'm like exactly what you're saying. It's, it's that autonomy and you don't know what what you know is going to come through that door and all that and you're, you're caring for across an entire life lifespan. It's amazing. So I just wanted to add that. Um, in terms of staying in the north. Um... Yes, definitely the variety of the work environment, um, as uh, Laura and, and Jess um, commented on, um, full scope of practice um, and really being able to know the patients and their families. Um, and um, I will say that there was a time where I was considering going back to Hamilton and I remember going to a family practice office and having a tour around and and uh, they had like an orthopedic room. And I'm like, oh, that's so great. Like, so if you see somebody with, with an injury, it's a large family practice office. So they did some urgent care. I said, like, if it's a simple, like, you know, type injury that needs to be immobilized, like I can do a scaphoid cast in this ortho room, right? And they're like, uh, no, that's where our orthopedic surgeon does uh, their clinics when, when they come. Um, and, I'm, and I was, oh, well, that's odd. <laughs> it, that seemed really odd to me because that was normal for me um, working in the North, um, being able to put that cast on and then change the cast in a couple of weeks and then walk the patient down to the rehab department and, you know, get the, the next sort of steps um, um, started um, for the care of that patient. Um, so I did stay in Atacokan and um, the community and the area, there's lakes everywhere, being able to go for a walk or a cross country ski or a snowshoe all on the same trails. Um, so, um, and having friends um, and then, you know, family came along and uh, there's uh, as the amazing opportunity to raise a family in a small town where um, you can play hockey in the morning and go downhill skiing in the afternoon and um, make it home for a nice, nice cooked supper. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's my kind of story of staying, staying in the north.
Um, so the next question is uh, the everyday life in your career. So if you were to walk through, I know many of you said every day was different. And that's kind of one of the advantages of living in the North. You don't see the same thing every day, um, but kind of just like an average day of what you do in your occupation. Um, I can go. So um, every morning we start by um, going to the acute care and kind of doing our rounds for the day, finding out new patients, finding out um, how your current patients are doing. Um, on certain days of the week, we might do like a, an actual discharge round. So just kind of talk with all the community partners, um, including like our family health team and our mental health workers about people who are going home just so we can kind of create that smooth transition home. Um, usually I have a few outpatients sprinkled through my day. So I treat um, fingertips to shoulders. So um, either trauma, degeneration, repetitive strain injury. Um, so I may do that. So the physical rehab side of my job, I may do the adaptation, making custom splints. Um, on some of the days I'll do my um, long-term care uh, piece. So that may look like wheelchair and walker prescription, um, prescribing adaptive devices, consulting with our care team, like maybe the dietitian about um, trying to find, you know, certain adaptive devices to help with um, consuming their nutritional needs. Um, and then I do my acute care piece. So that is assessing somebody's ability to move, transfer off their bed, you know, move around, get on and off the toilet, in and out of the shower, making sure that where they're at in the hospital is going to meet their needs to go home. Um, that usually looks like communicating with the nurses and the doctors and our inter interdisciplinary team. Um, and then my afternoons are really full of outpatients. So lots of um, kind of treatment of injuries. Um, and throughout the week, I often have slots where I go into the community. Um, my service area for the um, home care is quite broad. So I will travel, I kind of service like the, I service a few First Nation communities. Um, some of them take two and a half hours each way to get to. Um, so those will be like a full day venture, but uh, we do mostly service um, our town. So the great thing about living in a small town, it takes me five minutes to get anywhere. So I can often fit two visits into an hour and a half slot. Um, and then at the end of the day, I do uh, my boatload of paperwork that I've acquired from all these visits and then I go home. Okay, um, so I was, I was jack of all trades too, um, as well. Um, I did home care, one contract, um, and then I did uh, uh, public health, um, but uh, primarily I did, um, so we do primary care. So that would be nine to five, we do primary care, so we do well baby, well child, well met, well men, clinics, uh, chronic, um, um, our chronic um, disease um, clinics. Um, and then, and then there would be a nurse on call. So either whether I'm on call or not, it would depend on the day. If I was scheduled a nurse on call, maybe twice a week, I would take all the immediate calls, the clients calling in. So sometimes we would have emergencies just come in. It depends. Sometimes it's babies, adults, variety of different health. It could be seizures, um, uh, mama in labor, um, variety of uh, children, um, uh, seizures, like you just never knew what was, was coming in. Um, and it was nice because um, my scope was a lot broad. So there, we had a formulary, so there were medications um, that uh, I could prescribe independently. Um, uh, but we would use something called FINIB guidelines, so I had to be specific to the FINIB guidelines throughout my assessments to, you know, have a rationale and a base to make decision making on medications that I could, um, I could prescribe. Um, the well babies were really fun because you get, the, get to see the cute babies that come in when they were just born and it was really nice because you would do the mom's prenatals 
and then they would leave the community and then they would come back and then you you know they have their little baby with them so that was really really nice so I got to do like their first well baby visit and um, so those were really that was really nice I always really liked that um, and then we would do medevacs which could it could be intense some days uh, you know you could get a call at two in the morning and someone could be in, going into shock or they had a quad accident so or someone went out on the land and had like severe frostbite so you were just the nights on call were intense because you didn't sometimes you wouldn't really get sleep that was that's the reality of northern nursing like you, you do your primary care clinic from nine to five and then you'd be nursing and then um, you'd be nurse on call. It could be first on call or second on call. Um, and then some of the communities didn't have doctors, don't have doctors. So it would be you and a team of nurses or um, a community I went to is the most Northern community um, in Canada called Grease Fjord. And it was just a two nursing station. So it was just me and another nurse. Um, so, you know, weather, could, you know, you could be, you, you could be waiting for a medevac and the ceiling's low, meaning the clouds are so low by the mountain and they, the medevac can't uh, fly in. So some days were really intense. That's the reality of Northern nursing, um, but uh, very rewarding and there was, it was challenging, um, but that was the realities of the day. Sometimes you just, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't know where it would go. Uh, <laughs> that's just how it was. So you had to be very flexible, just very flexible, just ready to go. Whatever comes to you, you're ready to go. Um, and then uh, communicating with um, doctors outside of the community. Because some of those communities, uh, you know, had 300 people, 200 people in the community. Um, and some of the larger communities had 3,000 people. So some of the nursing stations were a lot busier than compared to other nursing stations. Um, but you were the phlebotomist, you're, you're admin, you're, you're everybody, <laughs> you are the resource, you are there to care for the clients. So um, that was pretty much, yeah, that was, that's, a, that's, um, that was like a typical day. Yeah, very similarly um, to Simone and Jess, uh, I do a little bit of everything. So uh, most days I attend the same morning rounds that, is, that Jess does. So we, we hear about the people who have been admitted or discharged or are planning to go home, kind of get a, a summary of anybody who's admitted to the hospital. Um, after that, I would normally see people that who need nutrition services who are admitted to the hospital, um, whether it's for diet teaching or modifying their diet while they're admitted, um, ordering supplements, things like that. Um, then we do quarterly assessments for residents in long-term care or annual assessments. So that was that's something that's mandated by the government or something that that um, is is legislated to be done. So kind of reviewing people who live in long-term care, um, how their eating's going, checking over people's weights to see if they're um, unintentionally losing weight or gaining weight, um, kind of problem solving there if anything comes up, uh, working with dietary staff so just making sure operations in the dietary department are going well we're getting our orders there um, everything from from their end is going well um, two days a week I work for an outpatient family health team so that's where I'll see people who aren't admitted to the hospital or in or in long-term care just people who need to see a dietitian that might be for their diabetes it might be for heart disease um, pregnancy to help people gain weight lose weight everything in between um, yeah, and then like Jess does as well, I do home care too. So I actually, um, until very recently, did home care for the whole Rainy River region. So I could have to drive up to three hours one way to go see a patient. Um, and so, but recently I, I took on a much smaller uh, geographic area just because it was a little bit tricky to, to be able to go see people at such a long distance. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it varies day to day um, and you never know what's going to get thrown at you like everybody else said and that's why it's fun. <laughs> um, 
I, I guess my everyday life has, has evolved o- over the years, um, you know, depending on where in, in my life um, um, cycle I, I was. So, you know, when, they're, when the children were younger, the flexibility in working in a rural community really is amazing being able to schedule uh, a work day um, that uh, that was flexible so that I could go to see a concert at school or go watch a volleyball game or a basketball game or or something like that. Uh, that's a real advantage working working in a small community um, is being able to to schedule a day um, that can fit in those types of um, life events that are so important. Um, These days, um, kids are older. Um, I do tend to take a little block of time um, for charting um, midday um, because the charts do go crazy, crazy, (laughs) as Jessica said. Um, And with having, I don't know if you saw my puppy um, jump up on the couch when I sat down, but um, I do take a little bit longer um, time at lunch um, just to make sure she can get out and do some charting from home um, before I go back to the afternoon. Um, in a rural community, there's a fair bit of um, committee work um, helping um, the different organizations plan their programs and that kind of thing. So I do work on the hospital formulary, um, having a look at, at that. Um, I have served um, in the hospital in the role of chief of staff, um, which is a great opportunity that some doctors don't get in, um, in bigger communities, um, and president of the medical staff um, as well. Um, so, and working with the family health teams. So there's great variety um, in the different responsibilities that we have. So right now, um, I do um, with the hospital formulary and working with the staff um, to help organize um, uh, admission order sets um, that we can use when a patient is admitted into hospital. And so we work collaboratively with the rehab department, with the um, dietitian, um, with the pharmacy technicians. Um, yeah, so um, every day is different, really, um, which we uh, seems to be a pretty common theme with what we're all saying. Yeah. Okay, and then the next question is the advantages of your career. I think, like we said, the variety um, and the autonomy. Uh, you you get to. You get to manage how you want to structure your day. You get to develop your own programs, uh, kind of pursue things. Or um, when, if you notice a gap, you kind of have the ability to to fill it a bit more in terms of services for for the community, which is which is really rewarding. So I think we touched, or I I touched on on a lot of the advantages already. I think I interpreted the question a bit differently. Do you want to know the advantages of just my general career or my career in the North? Um, I think it was more directed to the North, but if you want to talk about the advantages in general, that's good too. Cool. I'll do a little bit of both. Um, so I think the advantage of my career in the North, like Laura said, the flexibility and the autonomy is definitely up there. Um, but I think like my career as an OT specifically, the advantage is that my scope is so broad. Um, I have friends who work in mental health and work in forensic psychiatry. I have friends who work and are tan therapists. So I, being working in the North, get to do everything. I do, I think I, I'm naive to say I don't do mental health. I think mental health is integrated into every facet of healthcare. I may not treat you know, specifically with like psychotherapy, um, but anyone who comes in with an injury or a change in function, we're kind of working through that. Um, but yeah, the advantages of, of being in the North is that I get to kind of dive into all the areas of occupational therapy. Um, and I'm always learning. I'm in like my fourth, almost fifth year of, of working. And I, I still, most days feel like I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, which drives me to kind of continue to do the research, continue to kind of do some professional development and 
kind of work with my peers and my um, my coworkers to kind of problem solve all those unique things that I will likely never do for like another five years. And then I'm gonna have to start all over again because that's what it is in the North. When it rains, it pours, you'll get like tons of shoulder replacements and then I won't see them for years. And then I'm starting all over again. Uh, so when I was doing um, contracts, um, that was great because I would work for three months straight or longer, and then I'd come home and take a break. <laughs> that was really nice. So I was able to have balance because I I oh I went I would go by myself everywhere. I was always by myself. I never had my no friends, no family. Everyone was is home in Toronto. So um so for so I'll just back up. So. When I lived in Northwest Territories, I lived there for five years straight. Um, so I would visit like once or twice a year. Um, but then when I started doing contract, I, it gave me that flexibility to visit home and go back up north. But I always made an intentional, I made an intentional decision to go to the same communities um, because I, at least I was a familiar face um, and I got to know people in the, in the community. Um, so yeah, the flexibility was wonderful and yeah, I think I, I touched on it earlier too, just the autonomy, it was just amazing, the autonomy, uh, and I think that was kind of challenging coming back home to Toronto is some of that is, has, was taken away <laughs> a little bit and, uh, I, I, that part has been, that was actually, I, I really had to adjust to that being back home in the city. Um, with with uh, just certain skills, like I, I can't do stitches anymore. <laughs> you know, the, it's like, no, <laughs> you can't, you, you know, I, I, they won't allow me to do that. So, um, so some things were taken away, you know, or uh, using the formulary and like, oh, they should get, you know, maybe they should order this. Like, I can't do that anymore, right? I, and, and, I, and that's okay, I love collaboration. But you know, if, when you're used to a certain way of nursing or anything, right? And then some of so then there's limitations put on you after a while. There's an adjustment, right? So, um, so that's that that's the advantage of the autonomy and um, just spending that. Actually, I think with the, the organization I'm with now, there's still that element to it is getting to know the the, the client um, uh, um, holistically. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, it's just, it's just great. <laughs> yeah, I would say that autonomy is really wonderful. And I, I just, I felt like I just had this freedom to just learn so much and apply that, that knowledge um, with evidence-based research, of course, but uh, that, that part is wonderful. Um, yeah, I think that Laura really, really summarized it. It's, I, it's interesting that in, with the different careers that we have, it's the same, it's the same themes. Um, and, um, it just goes to show how much of a team effort it really is to provide, uh, care for, for the residents and the community members, um, in, in rural communities that, that we, we have similar, experiences and similar viewpoints as to the advantages of the work that we do. So the next question is the possible disadvantages of your career. This could also include um, the possible barriers of working in the North that you face. Um, so I think like the biggest disadvantage um, in my situation, so I mean, for kind of the background, I'm the only OT in about a 200 kilometer radius in like any direction. Um, so people tend to come to me for questions. Um, again, being in a generalist role, it's often things I've like A, never done before or B, haven't done in a very long time. Um, so I feel like there tends to be a lot of pressure, either, you know, probably mostly internally put in, in all honesty. Um, but you, because I'm the only one, 
doesn't mean I don't have colleagues to ask questions to, but no one else has my job. So I really have to rely on, you know, either my network of, of classmates from my, my, under, my master's degree, or you really have to work hard to make those relationships with your um, kind of colleagues in, in the same profession as you, because when you get into a pickle and you have this really complex wheelchair that you haven't done before, you don't have anybody super easily accessible to ask those questions to. Um, so that's definitely a disadvantage as a new um, new professional is is coming into an area where you you know in school you have tons of people to bounce off ideas and now you're in the real world and it's just you and Dr. Google. So lots of googling, lots of reaching out to your uh, colleagues um, and your classmates. But I think you know the the hardest part is kind of feeling alone sometimes. But the um, advantage is I am a excellent problem solver. Um, I come up with, you know, novel strategies that people have never seen before because I literally don't have another choice. I need to fix the problem, no clue how to do it. I can't go and I get anyone else to do it. So I'm gonna figure it out on my own. Be it that I, I now have a network of, of people, um, you know, in my, my region that I can kind of reach out to. Um, I think the biggest thing about working in the North is shadow as many people you can, even when you're in this role already, um, and kind of make those connections, go to other workplaces, because you're going to want to pick their brains at some point. I, I'll go next because I'll just add on to Jess's because all of those apply to me as well. Um, I find one of the, the disadvantages of my career, something that we've mentioned before is there's always a, a low grade level of panic, I feel, because you never feel like you're fully, like you know everything about a certain topic, which comes with being the jack of all trades. It's the master of none part of the jack of all, of all um, trades um, expression, right? Um, so you're always like, ooh, gotta look that up. Uh, but it keeps you on your toes. Like Jess said, um, being the only dietitian um, is a little bit more difficult. You don't have somebody right there to bounce ideas off of, but you, you, you can always reach out to other people, which is, which is really um, great. Um, I've also done a lot of shadowing, which has been really awesome. I shadowed at the eating disorder clinic in Thunder Bay and with the diabetes program, just to kind of um, make contacts there that I can reach out to if needed and just um, to kind of see how other people do things. Um, lastly, I think it's um, because you're, you're working in so many different areas, a lot of times it really doesn't feel like you have enough hours in a day. Um, but for the most part, I would say the, the advantages of the career really outweigh the disadvantages. And like I said before, like the hardest parts of your job are also the most rewarding parts of your job. So the disadvantages turn around, come around and end up being the, the things I, I kind of like the most about my job in some ways, if that makes any sense. Okay, um, I think whew, that's, a, it's a, that's a deep question. Um, I, I, I think of over the years and a lot of challenges that I faced. Um, so I think, I think that could be a panel altogether, a whole a separate panel. I, I really think so, especially, I would say disadvantages and I'd say challenges. Um, Cause you know, sometimes disadvantages, you know, can, like we just mentioned, some disadvantages can turn into something positive, right? Um, but I, I would say challenges, especially with clients, you know, especially if you're in an underserved community, and you know, and you've also lived in um, in like the city or or you know other communities that have more access to care, that was hard sometimes. Um, you know, just accessing specialized um, professionals, and 
you know, yes, we're healthcare professionals, but we're also human, you know, and, you know, when you want to influence change and you, you, you know, you want access to care, you want people to get, and then we all have our ideal of what good healthcare is. And when some of those resources are not available and you want to use them or just accessing it is so challenging, that could be so hard. And it's not just on like, not me, 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 but the client, because you know, in your heart and, and just your morale that they deserve the best care. And sometimes those resources are just not there or you, but you focus on the resources you do have as a strength, right? Um, that's important too. But I found that very challenging, very challenging. There were times I, I would go, I'd go home and I'd be like, wow, like this is, it, it was intense sometimes. But, um, but it was also, yeah, it was, it was also rewarding because you're there, you're there to help. You're there to, if there's not a resource available, you will find a way, you will find a way and to provide the best care you can with what you have. So I used to find that challenging. Communication was challenging sometimes, depending on the community that you're at, um, you know, cause it was telehealth. Sometimes the, the, the technology is not working, faxes aren't going through. Like there's a lot of challenges. But um, you just kind of roll with it. And then it's not that you're going to go, you're going to come across the same, sometimes you'll come across the same situations. And then that's just how you learn and you get, you get stronger, you get more resourceful, resilience, and you just learn to kind of work around those disadvantages and challenges um, to meet clients' needs. So, and I will say personally, depending on the community, things like food insecurity, um, you know, that's a challenge, you know, even preparing to go up north. Do I have enough food? Does this community have banks? You know, I'll, I'll have to bring extra money with me. Um, you know, uh, will you be roommating or will you be living by yourself? Are you someone that can roommate? Like these are things that you need to ask yourself and, self and discover or, or, or to, to, to meditate on and just knowing who you are, what you're comfortable with, what you're not. Um, and just even, even if there are disadvantages ahead or there will be challenges, you can always prepare yourself. And that's by asking the right questions before you take on any adventure up north. I think that's so important because I've seen, I've seen it a lot where healthcare professionals would go into the smaller communities and they're completely shocked and they're, it's not what they expected. So just be prepared, ask questions. And it's okay to ask questions um, because you know you're you know you're there to help, but you know you need to look out for for your well being as well. If your glass isn't poured full, if you if your glass isn't filled, you can't pour into someone else's glass, right? So just always being prepared for those challenges, and then some will just come at you, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> you will. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was thinking about uh, Laura had commented that um, often the disadvantages um, have a way of, of becoming an advantage. And, and I can think of an example. Um, it, it is difficult um, in a rural community. We, we, we rely on each other, which is great, um, but it can be difficult um, in terms of when there is an emergency, it's all hands on deck and um, you have to go like now <laughs> to help um, in the emergency department um, or in acute care, something like that. And, and I can remember an example um, and I had to like take my child like somewhere now to be cared for so that I could go and help in the emergency department. And, 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 you know, it, in a larger community that wouldn't you know, that might not happen because it wouldn't be such a broad um, scope of the different things that, that we would do. Um, but it, it comes around because the, the advantage is that, that the people in my life that would be able to um, open the door and, and uh, welcome my child into their home were, were like my best friends, right? So those were certainly the advantages, having those people to rely on um, to support um, that uh, work-life balance um, when work um, had a, uh, yeah, a, a turn of course. Um, so yeah, I'm glad, Laura, that you commented that the disadvantages can, be, can become advantages. Um, recruiting professionals into the North is, um, is a difficult challenge. 
Um, so sometimes um, we gave examples of how it happened par chance, right? Laura is now a full-time dietitian. Um, Jessica is um, working in the rehab department and, uh, and Simone has uh, done a lot, uh, lots of different things um, in, in, in the North. Um, we're always recruiting for um, various different healthcare um, professionals um, to be part of the team to care for these communities. And it is a, an ongoing everyday um, thought process. Yeah. Okay, and then last one, does anyone have any questions or do any of the panelists want to add anything else? Jessica, I had to just say something. My background's Trinidadian, so I was really happy to hear that you enjoyed your time there. I was, that was really nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, it was in Port of Spain at um, one of the special needs schools. It was amazing. I would oh, I would I go that. back in a heartbeat. It was so good. Oh, that's really, that's so nice to hear. I just have to say that before we end. <laughs> that's wonderful. I do see a quick question. Um, this could be for anyone. It's the aspect of living in such a small community um, and in regards to like confidentiality and remaining professional when you, you know, your neighbor needs to come in to see care and, you know, you're the only dietitian, you're the only OT or you're the eMERGE doc on call and, you know, you're seeing someone that you know really well, but you still have to like remain professional and um, provide them care has... Is that like true? Have you experienced that? Or how do you like remain professional in those situations? I think that's something we talk with our learners about a lot. Um, it can be scary um, to come into a new community and wonder about, right? Who am I gonna make friends with? Or um, how do I approach that if somebody um, I see somebody who, who is a friend, um, but I often look at it from the perspective of mm, patient probably has the same questions, right? Um, that they might feel awkward about, um, you know, seeing their, uh, in the eMERGE department, their, their doctor who they were playing baseball with the day before, <laughs> right? Um, so it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a two-way street and, and just sometimes just, to be honest about it, right? Like, um, you know, I am the emergency do doctor today. Let's um, let's let's uh, deal with what we need to. And when we're talking about making our follow up plan, we can talk about um, who you might want to see for your follow up care. Um, if if uh, um, I'm quite happy to provide that care, I can talk with one of my colleagues um, if we both feel that um, there's there's too much of a, a friendship. Um, and, you know, some of the most rewarding care is with people whom you know, um, because you know, like they've made a decision to trust you, um, even though that they, they might know you personally. Um, it could be a little odd, you know, going through the grocery store. That's the common question we get, right? Um, I, do you talk to people in the grocery store? And I'm like, sure, you know, and they, they call me Joanne. They don't say Dr. Spencer, you know, how are you today, Joanne? And they truly are interested in, in me and, and my well being, um, And I find that really rewarding in a rural community that um, the community um, is invested in everybody's, in everybody's well-being and, and they care about us as much as we are caring about the, the work that we do for them. I have to say though, to add to what Joanne said, it is weird. To, when you get into the profession, when you're in a grocery store and the internal dialogue going on your head, of, do I say hi to them? If I say hi to them, is someone going to know they're my patient? Is that breaking confidentiality? I, I think like what I've learned is like, it's totally okay to say hi and be pleasant. And if someone asks how you know them, just say like, oh, I just know them from around town. Um, if a patient past or present bring something up in front of someone else like oh like this is my occupational therapist I won't elaborate on it but it's like they've mentioned how we know each other um but I, I think 
um, something Joanne mentioned about treating, um, you know, friends um, or family. I think like the benefit to, for like Laura and I is, I mean, usually people aren't coming to us on death's door where like in that moment, we have to treat somebody who um, our treatment is going to keep them alive or not. Um, but that said, um, it is something, you know, I've run into, my grandfather was palliating at home um, a year and a bit ago and he needed adaptive devices. And it was a conversation I had with my family, you know, are you okay with me providing care? Once they said yes, I went through like a really extra thorough um, explanation of, you know, who this information can be shared with. I don't talk to family about anything. No one's allowed to ask me anything. If they want to ask you about this, you know, they can talk to you and you can tell them I'm involved. Um, it, you kind of have to take a little bit extra steps because there is a conflict of interest. Um, I do that with anybody I know um, on a friendship level, anyone I, I am even, you know, remotely related to like a great aunt and uncle or, you know, my third cousin. Um, I will not treat um, any immediate family after the experience of treating my grandfather. I think it was a great experience and my family really appreciated it um, because obviously I was able to provide him care so he could die at home. Um, but I didn't anticipate how emotionally um, like troublesome it would be for me. Um, it, it really, really affected me um, because I was no longer his granddaughter. I was his occupational therapist. And when I was, you know, at his home when he was passing, I was still kind of being treated like the medical professional in the room. And I think it was great for my family in the sense that I was the one calling the doctor, that I was the one doing everything. Um, but it's, I think, not only to protect the, our patients, but it's to protect ourselves. Um, and so those boundaries are really hard to maintain in small towns and it's a learning experience. And I don't think um, you really know where your boundaries lie until you kind of get in to the, the rural um, medicine side of things. I would say in the uh, communities, um, same thing, the grocery store. If that was my culture shock. I was like, oh, um, and, you know, like sometimes clients would look at me and smile. Some clients would not even, they'd look at me and just have a straight face and keep walking. So you just kind of, you, you just, you just get, you know, the social cues, you kind of pick up on that. And then, you know, you just maintain those professional boundaries. Um, but I also thought it was a, it was a strength though. What if, I mean, we wouldn't discuss anything medical, but it was a bit of a strength because they're like, oh, hi, smart. I'm like, oh, hi, how's it going? And then that was in and they'll keep going. But it was great because a lot of the people in the community were reluctant to come to the health center because they were worried about confidentiality because their cousin works um, uh, as a medical office assistant in the front um, and they didn't want to disclose why they're you know what the appointment is for so some of it so you know a lot of people from the community worked at the health center so sometimes people were reluctant to come to get specific um, health care you know so when I you know building that trust it, it was slow but once you build that trust, you know, I, I started to discover, hey, you know what, if I see them, they say hello, wonderful, but you know, just, you know, move on with the day. And sometimes, you know, there would be activities outside of work, you know, if it was a new day or, um, uh, you know, they had a, the jamboree on the ice road or whatever activity was going on, we'd see you out and we'd talk, you know, and, and if anything medical related would come, I would just put that in, in a kind way, a gentle way, therapeutic way, and just put that boundary that, oh, okay, you know, maybe we can... Um, book an appointment with me and we can further discuss that. And then they would, you know, they would get the, they would, they would see where I was going with that. And then would, you know, or just talk about something else because it's so community oriented. It's, it, it, you know, you just have to find ways to um, put that professional boundary in a, in a therapeutic way, you say it in a, a way that I care, but this is just not the appropriate place to discuss this. So you just, I would just redirect the, the, the conversation in, in a nice way and I, I, that that worked for me but I, I liked 
But if I saw them out, out and then they said hello, I would just say hi and then I'd just keep keep going. And if they wanted to discuss small talk, I, I had no problem with that. But I I, I used to just be really uh, mindful, um, like who was around and stuff. Sometimes it was it, it was challenging though. It was a huge culture shock for me. Um, even people in the community, when I would go to a new community, they're like, oh, hi. Uh, and someone knew my name. I'm like, how did they know my name? Like, you know, like that was like, I was just, <laughs> I was like, I just got here yesterday, you know? Like, so um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> For me, the benefit is not being from here. So I didn't know as many people going into my, into my practice sort of thing. And for me, sorry, somebody's about to come to the door, but um, it's a lot of sometimes playing dumb in a, in a professional way. Oh, did you know so-and-so's in the hospital? Oh, no, I didn't. Hmm. And then moving on with the conversation. So uh, yeah, that's, that's how I deal with it. It is a bit more of, a, of an issue in a small town, but they're, like everyone else has said, there's ways of working around it. Well, thanks for answering that question. I think you guys all, you guys all have some really good points. Um, I think if there's not, I don't see any more questions put in the chat. Um, if there's not any more questions, I guess we can conclude there. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for speaking today. I myself have learned a lot, even though I know lots of you personally. Um, I think the discussion we had was really great and I hope others felt the same way. Yes, and thank you for taking so much time to talk to us and share all your thoughts.